We better get to the main event. People have to work in the morning. Thanks for coming out on a school night, everybody. Okay. When we're through uh, refurbishing, we're gonna have a proper housewarming, but until then. Everyone, pick up a hammer and help us tear down some walls. Okay. <laughs> it's gonna be your wine cellar, buddy, so you get first crack. Great. Yeah. I get one room, she gets the whole house. As long as we're clear. I have always wanted to do this. All right, everybody, stand back. I'm not sure my homeowner's insurance covers blows to the head. <laughs> you swing like a girl. <laughs> there goes the music. <laughs> Hang on a second. There's something in here. Yeah. Keep that flashlight on there. I don't know. What is that? Can you tell us? Not much. Emmy won't be able to give you anything on year of death until we can get him out of here. Okay, we'll check in the morning. Look at this. What is it? Something I haven't seen in years. An L.A. gear jacket. Well, look, his shirt has a hood on it. Yeah, my guess is he's wearing Jordache jeans and Puma sneakers. I used to rock Pumas back in the day. Yeah. I used to rock members only. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. <sighs> Detectives? What is all that time? Well, besides his uh, questionable fashion sense, he's probably been back there since the 80s. Good morning, detectives. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start. These items were retrieved from the body. Digital watch, money clip with $147 in cash, no ID, this envelope sealed. Looks like there's more cash in there. Forensics will open it later today. Now, the body. Someone did a very good job of wrapping. The subject is fairly well preserved. Now, while the plastic they use served to mask the smell of decay, it also functioned as the perfect preservative of forensic evidence. Any bodily anomalies? The occipital bone has separated. It's unclear if it's trauma or skeletal decay over time. Two fingers broken and healed on the right hand. It also looks like he broke his nose once. A boxer? Or at least someone accustomed to putting up a fight. He's also missing his dorsal floating rib. It looks like a birth defect. How long till we get an answer for the time of death? Fortunately, the chest cavity is riddled with recluse spiders. The forensic entomologist will get to time of death within a year based on how many generations of spiders gestated. Wait a minute, what's that? Is that decay? Inconclusive. Looks like a brandy. He might be right. It's definitely a keloid scar. Branding. we will do that. Okay, so the house was built in 1921. It changed hands between private owners eight times until 1975 when Omega Kappa Rho bought it as its fraternity house. Omega Kappa Rho? Yep. <laughs> Hidden body's not a stretch. They're one of the most notorious of the black fraternities. Really? Oh, come on, man. You didn't know that? You're not a fraternity boy? I'm not a college boy. A couple of my uh, sorority sisters used to date some of those gorillas for a minute. It was one hardcore house. Branding pledges was for openers. Ritual beatings with whips and hammers, drinking vomit. I thought they weren't around anymore. Actually, they're not. In fact, this particular house had its charter revoked in 1981. They operated as an unaffiliated house until the demise of the whole fraternity in 1992. But what if that could 
be my boy. The detectives just got the case yesterday, ma'am. We're just gonna have to give him a little more time, okay? Listen, I have been here since 7 a.m. this morning. Now, can I speak to somebody? Officer Andrews, would you help this lady, please? Please. Our son went missing 20 years ago. Here's a picture. He's got a long scar right down his right leg. Sir. Police officers, if we could just talk to a detective for five minutes. Ma'am, I understand, but you see all these other people are ahead of you. Look, he was an athlete. He broke his nose when he was 16. Last name? Rami. First name? We were so poor, poor people lent us money. So when Dennis got a full football scholarship, it was like we won the Irish sweepstakes. He was the first in either family to go to college. Ever since he was a child, we kept on saying, you college material, baby. Hard-working kid. Board work till he dropped unless somebody stopped him. <clears throat> when your son went missing in 84, the police report states that he may have been the victim of a robbery or a suicide? Yeah, we was told that. But we never believed it. He had so much to live for. But we had to move on. I mean, after a while, you run out of tears. So we buried our boy in our minds years ago. But if it is our son, he deserves a proper burial. Dennis joined a fraternity. Omega Kappa Rho. That's all he could talk about. He was so excited that they had accepted him. Hmm. Now, did his fraternity brothers give him any tattoos or, or markings? Not that we know of. So is it true that they wrapped Dennis in plastic and buried him in a wall? Well, we don't know if it's your son. Well, it's somebody's boy. How can someone do that? Did Dennis have any unusual physical characteristics? What do you mean? Anything we can use to make an accurate identification. He was born without one of his ribs. Doctors said it would affect his breathing, but he was fine. Do you have our son? We're still searching for answers, sir. The parents reported Dennis missing October 20th, 1984, the day after homecoming weekend. The original police report says that his car was found at the beach. There were also some stolen items in his room, a Walkman, CD player, you know, some things that his frat brothers had been missing. He was also going to be cut from the football team, so the assumption was suicide. Uh, maybe it was. Maybe he wrapped himself in that plastic and climbed into the wall. Hey, hey. What you got on 84? 1984, Omega Caparo had 41 actives and pledges, or line brothers, as they called them. Yeah, well, the way I see it, if you're going to stuff somebody inside a wall, you either move very far away or you stay close. Well, let's start with close. All right. Nine of them still live in the L.A. area. Great. Let's get to knocking on some doors. Well, maybe we can save on the shoe leather. Tomorrow, let's host ourselves on Omega Kappa Rho reunion. All right. Raymond Washington, Kevin Dunnigan, Greg Hamer, Judge Carl Bouchard, John Federa. Perfect attendance. A call from Homicide Division tends to clear a man's schedule. Blue shirt. He keeps looking at the mirror. Raymond Washington. Could be nurse. Or maybe he's used to being in an interrogation room. What about the red sweater? Kevin Donegan. What's his deal? Guilt, poor social skills. That square ass head of his. What about the well put together one? Uh, Marvin Lloyd. Yeah, I've heard of Marvin Lloyd. School teacher in Watts. Teacher of the year, if I'm not mistaken. You see something? That's what I'm not seeing. And these frat boys haven't seen each other for a while. Even under these circumstances, there should be a fair amount of glad handing. Well, who isn't happy to see each other? Let's start with Blue Shirt. Homecoming weekend, 1984. What about it? Any idea where you were that week? I was a junior. And? That was my junior year abroad, London and Amsterdam. You have any way of proving this? You can ask my wife. That's when I met her. Homecoming, 1984. Yes? I know it's been a long time, but do you remember your whereabouts that evening? Yes, you do. 
There was a huge party, an Orwellian theme. 1984, get it? I was there, maybe a few pounds lighter, a little more hair. Why well, remember so much about some random party? That's the night I met Libby. Libby? That's your girlfriend? For the night, let's say there's a first time for everything. We had to go outside into the bushes behind the house because my roommate was passed out on my bed. There was no place else to go because the house was being remodeled and there was construction crap every place else. Wait a minute. Outside was our last choice. First, we tried the chapter room in the basement. You were allowed to go there when you had a short thing. But it was locked. I remember hearing voices, so I knocked. Come on, man, I need the room. Owen? Was Dennis in the chapter room? Yeah, he was. Dennis? Step off, Black. So what was he doing in there? I don't know. Except for hookups, Lion Brothers were never allowed to hang out in there. Chapter room was used for lineups, meetings, initiations. So what kind of initiation? Wild ass stuff. Medieval. They do things with car batteries. They made some guys eat dog food. And there were always the paddles. They douse guys with beer and God knows what else. One time I heard they strung a line brother up on a rope and weld on. Is that what was happening to Dennis? I don't know. I didn't find out. <laughs> Five minutes later, I didn't care. You said you heard voices. Who else was in the room? I don't remember, I... What? A little while later, I came back inside to get us some beers before round two. This was back in the day when there still was a round two, if you know what I mean. At any rate, that's when I saw three guys come up from the chapter room. It was Greg Hamer, Marvin Lloyd, and Carl Bouchard. Greg Hamer, Marvin Lloyd, Carl Bouchard. I don't know about you, but I'm getting the feeling that 20 years ago, before they were the dedicated, successful pillars of society they are today, that one of these men, or all of them, wrapped Dennis Romney in a sheet of plastic and buried him inside a frat house wall. Yeah, we all know Judge Bouchard. We know a little bit about Marvin Lloyd. But what do we have on Greg Hamer? Well, he's a self-made millionaire. He and his longtime companion, John King, started a photocopying chain in the 90s. Let's see what they have to say. Well, let's take the soft cells. Stay out of the interrogation room for as long as possible. Who gets who? I'll take Judge Bouchard. I went to school with a lot of guys like him. They're all proper now, but back in the day, they were beer-drinking, toga-wearing maniacs who loved to swat each other on the butt with paddles. Well, go get them. <laughs> But Joel, you take Hamer. You got it. You take Marvin Lloyd. Got it. Principal Lloyd. A vice principal. Hey, <laughs> my mistake. Please. Vice principal is about as powerful a job as vice president. I'm supposed to be in charge of discipline, but it really didn't work. Everybody knows I'm a marshmallow. I saw the news, detective. Was it Dennis's body in that wall? You remember Dennis? Yes. Was it him? Well, it looks like it. Quite a sigh there, Mark. So what's that about? Shock, surprise, and I'm sorry to say, relief. I presume you know that I was with Dennis a couple of nights before his parents reported him missing. Me, Greg, and Carl. Why do you presume that? You let everyone else but the three of us go. We were with him the night of the homecoming party, and for the last 20 years, I blame myself, us, for his death. Did you put his body in the wall? No. Nothing like that, God, no. Detective, how much do you know about Dennis Romney? Not much. We suspected him of stealing from his fellow brothers. Do you know that? Dennis... Dennis was a sweet kid. A real sweet kid. He was dirt poor from someplace down in South Central. Got to school on a football scholarship. The boosters used to like to lean on the fraternities to let the football players in. You know, give them some place to stay, some friends and whatnot. We got Dennis. It was never really his fault, but 
he didn't quite fit in, you know? I mean, he tried, but I don't know, maybe he tried too hard. So what happened that night? We were pretty sure he was stealing from us, so we decided to have an accounting in the chapter room. An accounting? It's fraternity speak for a trial. But we didn't want Dennis to know what was coming because the line brother going down to the chapter room usually involved physical pain of some sort. So we lured him there with the promise of a bomb party. Did you take our stuff, Dennis? We tried asking him some questions. But Tell us, man. <laughs> the weed was brutal, and he got so high he thought we were all kidding. So we decided to leave him there. Give him a chance to come down a little bit. When we went back an hour later, he wasn't there. And you never told the police any of this 20 years ago? Tell the police we were all stoned out of our minds on pot. Now, you started out by saying that you blamed yourself for his death. Well, I couldn't help but think, I don't know, maybe he wasn't as high that night as we thought he was, you know? Maybe he was pretending. Maybe he was listening to everything we were saying about him. I mean, we found out later that he was about to be cut from the football team. Maybe it was just too much for him. And so he, uh, he drowned himself. Right. Except that he didn't drown himself, though, did he? No. You have any idea who put his body in the wall? Detective, the last image I have of Dennis in my mind <laughs> is him sitting there holding that bomb. A bomb? Please. It was the last time we saw Dennis, Detective, but he sure as hell wasn't holding a bomb. This was during the 80s, Detective. The decade that took us from cocaine to Rogaine. To get Dennis down to the chapter room, we had to dangle some fat rails of Bolivian marching powder. Last time we saw Dennis, he was hunched over a mirror holding a rolled up dollar bill. He's a cocaine user? Why don't you get someone to give him some? What have you heard about Dennis? Not much. You know, sometimes when you have a fish out of water, you try to adapt. You grow legs, learn how to breathe different, how to walk. And sometimes that fish will give you the finger and say, screw you, you rich bastards. So he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> the size of Kansas. He never stopped going on about how we were all born with silver spoons up our butts. How we all thought we were better than him. You know, I, I know this isn't politically correct, but we were better than him. Because at least we were okay with who we were. Well, if you all didn't like him so much, why didn't you just kick him out of the frat? Point of clarification. It's called a fraternity. You know, sooner call your fraternity a frat than you'd call your country a... Uh... <clears throat> Why don't you just kick him out of the fraternity? I could never figure that out. Either he had friends in high places or he had a picture of someone with a goat. He was blackmailing someone? I'm joking. It's probably just pressure from the football boosters. And uh, that was the last time you saw him in that room? Yeah, we asked him some questions about the missing stuff. Where'd you get this money? From my trust fund, Brother Carl. Where'd you get this Walkman, Steve? But he was too high to answer. So we left him alone, let him come down. When we came back, he was gone. Two down, one to go. You're next. Not exactly. I told you I'd take care of him, not talk to him. A man like that could talk legal circles around me. <sighs> Catherine, I thought you'd forgotten about me. How could I ever forget you, Judge? 
I was expecting Detective Pierce. Well, she's attending to other matters right now. Shouldn't you? Me? Nah. I'm a full service DDA. I know what's going on here. Are Greg and Marvin being interrogated as well? Interviewed. Coffee? Sure, why not? Detective Pierce brews her own. French roast. Smart move. I can't stand the swill that they pour downstairs. How do you like it? Black. Uh, me too. Counselor, would it be paranoid of me to think that you're trying to attain my DNA by offering me a pristine coffee milk? Paranoia is a psychological prognosis, Your Honor. Collection of DNA requires the permission of the suspect. We both know it doesn't, and you're not a suspect. Bull. I adjudicate cases like these every day. Meeting with Detective Pierce was courtesy. This bait-and-switch tactic is tantamount to breach of promise. You're right. It was merely an extended courtesy. No estoppel to evoke, no promises were made or broken. Need I remind you, Counselor, that I have judicial immunity in this matter? Need I remind you that you don't have any immunity for actions you committed before you passed the bar? Actions I committed. Mm. Well, I think it's time for this judge to call an attorney. Before you spend every last dollar you ever made defending yourself as the star of the next trial of the century, ask yourself, is this how you want your life to end? After I walk out of here, We'll meet again. My bench, my rules, my rulings. I cannot wait for that day. That's not a threat. This is a threat. I could have you thrown off of every case that I'm on. I could have you recused under section 170.1, disqualification for actual bias. But that day is never going to happen. Do you know why? Because forensics is working overtime on this one. And you know they're going to find a fingerprint in the plastic, hair under the tape, something. This is your last chance to beat the DNA Express. Because right now, two of LAPD's best detectives are working their best game on two of your least reliable brothers. And you know who gets the best odds in this one? The guy who thinks first. What's going to be, Your Honor? Because time is a-wasting. Told the others that if we got attorneys at the jump, it would just draw attention. I also said that there's a good chance that no one would be able to connect us to Dennis and this whole thing would just slide by. But. Well, that's not the only reason I said no lawyers. I knew that if I had an attorney, he would advise me not to talk. But I suppose I want to talk. Now, before you do, have you waived your Miranda? Yes. Then tell me what the hell happened, Carl. It is not what you think. Really? Well, why don't you tell me what I think? It was an accident. We just wanted to ask him some questions about the things that were missing. When we got him to go down to the chapter room and do some cocaine. We started asking him questions. Hey! Did you take it? Hey! You beat the hell out of him. Yes. And it went on for quite some time. Now on the street there is violence. And then a lot of You damn thief. No, you got the wrong man, Holmes. I ain't no thief. You guys ought to see yourself, seriously. Look at that mirror off the table and have a look. You're hilarious. You ain't nothing but a welfare cheese eating mooch. Jim, right? Where'd you get this money? From my trust fund, Brother Carl. It's a lot like Brother Greg's trust fund, only non existent. Where'd you get this walk, man, thief? From the same place Brother Marvin got his. <laughs> the getting place. Get him up off the floor. Can't stand to see his sorry ass face for one second more. <laughs> We left him there to think it over. Uh, it's the last time any of us saw him. <laughs> we went back upstairs to the party. About an hour passed. We went back down to the chapter room. He wasn't moving. The cocaine that we had left on the table, that was gone, presumably up his nose. He had an overdose. I mean, we tried to revive him, but he was gone. So you didn't call 911? We, we, we talked about it, mm -hmm. yeah. But, but this was during the era of cocaine death scandals. We had all done some ourselves. It would have been in our systems if they had tested us. I mean, we would have been ruined. 
This was supposed to be the beginning of our lives, not the end. I mean, Marvin, he wanted to run for public office. Greg, he, he wanted to become a movie star, and I wanted to be a lawyer. None of that would have happened if we had ever called 911. So you decided to bury him in a wall? We wanted to take him to the ocean, but there was a party going on upstairs. And Marvin suggested that we take him out through one of those little windows in the chapter room, but there were some people outside. We just needed a place to hold him. 24 hours. And, and somebody, I, I, I can't remember who, uh, they suggested they suggested the wall. And how did you do it? The chapter room was a sty. We were in the middle of having a remodel. You know, in a way, I suppose we were kind of lucky. The construction crew had left behind everything we needed to hide the body. The plan was to take him out of the wall the next night, put him in his car, drive him to the ocean, and dump his body in it. It was supposed to look like a suicide. And what went wrong? We were all so hungover the next morning, we overslept. I was making my way through the party wreckage on the first floor when I heard the sounds. time I got downstairs, Dennis's tomb was already sealed. And we said nothing. We just went on with our lives. Look, look, look. We, we were young. All right, and, and it, yes, what we did was bad. Illegal, yeah. But it still doesn't change the fact that Dennis Roming died of an accidental, self-induced drug overdose. What about the cracked skull? What, nobody cracked his skull. What are you talking about? Well, that's not what the medical examiner says. Blunt trauma to the back of the skull looks like a two by four or a baseball bat. No, 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 no. That is impossible. I mean, he died of a drug overdose. Nobody ever cracked his skull. What are you talking about? What you already know. This wasn't some accident or youthful misadventure. This was murder, Your Honor. Well, Miss Roming was smacked in the back of the head hard enough to break his skull. Why would someone want to do that? Well, maybe it was an accident. It happened at the accounting. And then Carl came up with this drug overdose story to cover. That way they get uh, failure to report instead of manslaughter or reckless homicide. I don't think that was the story. I think it was telling the truth, at least as far as he knows it. You sure? If you spend as much time with guys like this as I have, you could tell. Yeah, well, I've never had the privilege. That's your point? It's no point. It's like you said, you spent more time with guys like you. Something on your mind, Detective? Well, nothing worth talking about. Hold on. Dennis Roming was found with a money clip full of cash. But he also had a sealed envelope with $600 in it. Why? Maybe he stole it. From who? As far as we know, nobody reported $600 stolen. Maybe somebody gave it to him. Why? That, some kind of payment. Maybe he did a job, or sold drugs. Or maybe he had a picture of somebody with a goat. What? Something Hamer said to me. Why didn't you kick him out of the fraternity? You know, I can never figure that out. Either he had friends in high places, or he had a picture of someone with a goat. He was blackmailing someone? I'm joking. Oh, well, maybe he wasn't joking. So who was Dennis Blackmail? I don't know. Are they still doing DNA tests on the saliva from the envelope seal? Sure. But it won't come in for weeks, and we might not even get anything. Right, but Greg Hamer won't know that. You like wasting my time, Greg? What? Why was Dennis blackmailing you? Excuse me? You heard me. Dennis was blackmailing you. Why? Dennis wasn't blackmailing me. Then why'd you give him a sealed envelope with $600 in it? You found the envelope, Greg. It was in Dennis's pocket. In 1984, DNA technology was just in its infancy. Not anymore. Caught that water bottle you were drinking out of earlier, swabbed it, the sample, put it in the analyzer. We compared it with the sample from the envelope. They matched. He swabbed it and put it in the analyzer. Let's see if he buys it. 
When you were licking that glue strip on the back of the envelope 20 years ago, you never in your wildest dreams imagined that it would come back to haunt you. The way your heart's pounding right now, I'd say that's probably about what it feels like to be haunted, wouldn't you? I have no idea how that envelope ended up on Dennis. But it was yours. Yes. And he was blackmailing you. Yes. Why? Do you have a picture of you with a goat, Greg? No. A baseball player. Threatening out with you? We didn't call it that back then. Back then, it was telling the world someone was in a life. Why don't you tell me what happened that night, Greg? I knew about the accounting. I gave Dennis a heads up. I was hoping he would give me some credit for it. Instead, he said if I didn't give him another $600, he would use the accounting as his opportunity to tell my secret. So I went to the bank, I got the money, I put it in the envelope, I was gonna give it to him later, but I never got the chance. And then the next morning, I noticed it was missing. And I never knew what happened to it until you brought it up right now. Right. Here's another possibility. You all left Dennis in the chapter room. Took that as your opportunity to pay him. So you went back downstairs, gave him the envelope, and something went wrong. No. What happened? No, whoa, whoa, time out. What happened? Time out! What happened? What happened? I never went back down there without the other guys. Why not? Because I could. Because the door was locked. And Carl, as the fraternity house president, was the only one who had the key. Maybe Carl did it. Now he has a rock solid alibi. He was playing foosball in the living room for the house championship. All right, so what about Marvin? Well, it's back to Carl with the only key. Okay, back to Carl. Maybe he paid someone to say he was playing foosball. Paid for his alibi. Uh, not possible. Yeah, maybe you're right. A college boy would never do something like that. What do you know about college, detective? Trust me, I know men like this. <laughs> so you keep saying. Detective, would you excuse us? So what is your problem? My problem? What is your problem? You got an issue with being the poor black child from the hood? I don't want to hear it. That's your problem. You can sling insults all you want to, because you're the one who's fronting, because you're from the hood just like me, and you know it. Bobby, you better check yourself. You know nothing about me. No, I know all I need to know about you. You know what I'm saying? Because you give yourself away. Your little clothes, your little attitude, your college education, they all say uptown, but you ain't fooling me. You were born poor, raised poor, and no matter how bougie you act up here, you're still poor. Well, you got one thing right. I did go to college. And the fact that you didn't or couldn't is your failing. My failing? Mm-hmm. Failing. I chose not to go to college. I had the full ride. I made a military choice to defend my country so that people like you could go to college, graduate, and come out and look down your noses at people like me. Boy, I am from Clancyville, North Carolina. We were poor, rural poor. None of your fancy-ass city poor. I only have one TV and no cable. We drank powdered milk and ate government cheese. When I got a full ride to state school, I worked hard, damn hard, to learn how to speak properly so I could fool the likes of them. Yes, yeah, so you could forget where you came from. No, so I could fool the likes of Judge Carl Bouchard and all the Marvin Lloyds of the world into thinking that I, too, was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Now, we shouldn't really be doing this, Bobby. Come on. Have you heard a word I said? Uh, yeah, powdered cheese and stuff. Powdered milk. You mix it with water, it turns blue. What is it? I know who killed Dennis Romney. Kill you, you know. Detective, how'd you know to look for me here? You know, we can spot our own. You? Well, I quit nine months ago. Better man than I. Dennis Rahman was a despicable blackmailing creep, wasn't he? Now, you told me he was just a poor, sweet kid who was just trying to fit in. But he wasn't that at all, though, was he, Martin? No. 
Dennis was a mean-spirited jerk with a chip on his shoulder. It was contorted by envy and self-hatred. That poor sweet kid, the one who was trying to fit in, that poor kid was you, wasn't it, Mark? You know what? They have this thing online where you can pull up old college yearbooks, high school yearbooks. That's you in college. Marvin Lloyd, eldest son of a West Virginia bank owner. And right over here, that's you in high school. Eldest son of a West Virginia bank guard. Come on, man, who doesn't polish their resume? <laughs> you know, I talked to some people at your school, Marvin. And you're the guy. You're the teacher that people remember for the rest of their days because you turn kids' lives around. But not because of the history lessons that you've taught. It's because of the life lessons. Don't do drugs, don't get pregnant, don't join a gang, don't do anything that you would regret for the rest of your life. I think we're done here. Excuse me. But you know the one thing I could not figure out was how. How did you get into a locked room with no key and no one seeing you? And then I remember, ah, Carl was the one who said that you suggested taking Dennis's body out through the basement window. Because that's how you got in, wasn't it? You have an active imagination, Detective. You should come and join our drama class sometime. Yeah, but there's one thing I want you to see before you go. Now, right here, I've got the medical examiner's report as to the cause of death. You know what that means, don't you? My God. Yeah, oh my God. That's right. God. I don't know why I felt I had to have those stupid things. I mean, a walk man, for God's sake. Dennis saw me take it. He was always sneaking around. You don't know, Detective, he really was an awful person. He said I had to give him money. Money I certainly didn't have. A couple of weeks later, he comes to me and says that Greg has told him about the accounting. He said that Greg was going to pay him $600 later that night to, to, to keep some secret. He didn't tell me what Greg's secret was, but he said he wanted the same from me. I didn't have $6, let alone 600 But I said I would get it as long as he kept his mouth shut in the chapter room, which he did. But barely. You guys ought to see yourselves. Seriously, look at the mayor off the table and have a look. You're hilarious. You ain't nothing but a welfare cheese eating mooch. Jim, right? Huh? Where'd you get this Walkman thing? In the same place as Brother Marvin. The getting place. Get him up off the floor. I don't want to see your sorry ass. Anymore. As I took him back to the couch, he says that his price has just gone up. My nose is bleeding, so it's an even thousand. Stairs into Greg's room and found Greg's envelope with the cash. And I got back into the chapter room through the window, like you said. So when I get there, Dennis is doing a line of coke. I give him the money, and he says that it's a, it's a good, good start. start. Now it's a thousand. What? He says he wants a thousand dollars every month. And so when he bent over to do another line of coke, yeah, I lost my mind. There was no pulse, no breath. And so I, I, I just sat him back up on the couch. And I went back out the window the way I came in. You know the rest. But I tried to make up for it, Detective. I, I found a job in a school near where he grew up. I like to think I made some kind of difference. And I kept telling myself, you've paid your debt. <sighs> what do you think, Detective? I don't know. You'll have to ask his parents.
have a seat. We have positively identified the victim found at the Omega Kappa Rho fraternity house as your son, Dennis. Are you sure? Your interview with us, as well as other physical evidence, makes us sure. What happened? There was a fight. A fight? Over what? Nothing important, just one of those things. And they got scared. Why would anybody want to fight Dennis? He was a good boy. H how did our son die? Was it painful? There are still tests that have to be done. But as much as we can tell, Dennis died quickly and painlessly. I chose the military because of my family. I mean, my brother was in, my uncle was a lifer. And I guess I was just afraid that I wouldn't fit in in college. I was afraid too. It's terrifying. Not nearly as terrifying as being shot at in Kuwait. North Carolina, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, that's nice and all, but I'm afraid you don't really know poor, because we were so poor. We couldn't afford the measles. Well, we were so poor, all we ate was jam sandwiches. Two pieces of bread jammed, jammed together. together. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's my joke. Isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Your son really wasn't a good boy, was he? No, but they don't need to know that. Or well, the truth about how he died. I mean, Dennis may have been a nasty blackmailing creep, but he did not deserve to die like that. The uh, medical examiner's report as to the uh, cause of death. You know what that means, don't you? Tonight, slip into those PJs and stay up late for NBC's Saturday Night Live. Tonight, hosted by Jack Black with the music of John Mayer. Your local news is next. When faced with violent attackers, one man wouldn't back down. How a robbery victim fought back and won. And 20,000 feared dead. The devastating damage left behind by Mother Nature. Next on The Night Beat.